Uh, good morning. David Meyer. Yep. Yeah, good morning. Sam Montoya here. Hey, how are you? Oh, good. Can you see my uh, screen? Uh, I do. Are you David? Okay, cool. I am. All right, well, I'm ready whenever you guys are. Not uh, not sure your format here, but uh, let me know when you're ready and we'll, we'll go. Okay. Um, had to unmute myself. Sorry about that. Uh, welcome to the April 21st uh, virtual users group. We have David Meyer, a system engineer with Nutanix on to present to us today. I will turn the, uh, the console and microphone over to him. Okay. So guys, thanks very much for uh, having me on today. Muted. Uh, hopefully a good uh, agenda for you, what we're going to cover. Uh, but this will be uh, Nutanix on Lenovo Part 2. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to do a kind of an abbreviated session of um, what we might call uh, our 200-level training. Uh, uh, if you guys were in, uh, I'm not sure how many of your group was in uh, uh, Raleigh last week. I think it was last week. My, my my weeks have run together lately, but uh, some of the some of the content that we had hoped to deliver to you uh, then, uh, we just ran short on time. Uh, but this is part of a greater training effort that we have to help uh, the Lenovo sales uh, team uh, be where they need to to present the the solution and and really to understand. So today we're going to go through. Uh, hey, David. A bit more. Yep. Go ahead. Um, just for your information, this has partners and customers on call. Oh, great, okay. So, Perfect. you know, they may not have seen it, but we did host one last month that came, gave an overview of um, uh, Nutanix and Lenovo and hyperconverged technologies, so. Okay, great, well, that's even better. So uh, okay. we're going to uh, uh, get right into it then. So uh, a little about me, I'm uh, out of Tampa, Florida. I cover uh, the OEM uh, relationship we have with Lenovo. I have the eastern half of the U.S., all of uh, Latin America, uh, the Caribbean, basically the pretty areas. But uh, been with uh, Nutanix a year this week, so it's an uh, exciting uh, time for me as well. Uh, but we're going to go through this. Uh, the presentation should uh, last uh, 30 to 45 minutes uh, with questions, maybe a little longer. And then the, the demonstration, usually uh, 20 to 30 minutes. But, uh, you know, again, this is all dependent on questions. So I'll get right into it. So uh, just real quick about Nutanix, uh, our, our goal is to make the data center inf infrastructure invisible because we want IT to focus on applications and services. We've got over 2,100 customers in 70 countries, six continents, uh, founded in uh, 2009, and uh, I think we're well over the 1,300 employee mark now, but we are continuing to grow, and it's exciting to uh, see the, the, uh, the trend. And so... If you didn't see uh, the part one of this, uh, this is real just a quick uh, uh, recap. Uh, we have uh, we have a problem, and that's three tier architectures don't scale very well. Um, you know, and this is we're talking about uh, servers attached to uh, fiber channel switches or even iSCSI switches attached to storage arrays uh, and storage controllers, and then you've got your virtualization layer on that. It just does not scale well. Um, and it's expensive. And when you talk about management layers, there's a lot of them. And typically, there's a lot of people managing these management layers. And then we have to talk about data migrations and all of the things that go into this. And while it was really good for a while, uh, we've, we've frankly come to the end of this era. And so what Nutanix said is, what if we can take all of the wonderful things that we're used to in a Tier 3 architecture, a replication, dedupe, compression, high availability, all those things, and put them into a commodity platform, an x86 platform, uh, that gives us all of those things. In fact, if you look at uh, many of the, the world-class data centers around the world, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Tumblr, Tumblr, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, they've all done just that. Uh, they, they, don't have, they don't have SAN in their environments because they're, 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 uh, they need to scale in such a way that, that it just works, and so they rely on uh, – they rely on, on x86 servers to do that and software to do that functionality. And 
the idea is as you scale out, you go faster, you have more compute, you have more storage, you have more networking. Everything just just goes faster. There is no more bottlenecks, and there's no more uh, forklift upgrades. So we'll, we'll go into that a little bit later. But you're still going to have your application, your virtualization layer, and it doesn't really matter uh, what your hypervisor of choice is, whether it's VMware, Hyper-V, or uh, the Acropolis hypervisor from Nutanix. Uh, the idea is, is we want those apps to be your priority, not the underlying infrastructure. Uh, it was once told to me by a, by a uh, CEO of a company here in, in Florida, he said, I'm in the land business. I'm not in the IT business. And IT is too complicated. It's too expensive. I need IT to work for me. I need IT to make money for me. I need, not, I need for IT not to cost me money. He needed somebody to focus on the application layer. Uh, and so that's what, we, that's what we do. Okay, so again, off the shelf, and cool, you know, that's a, a relative term, x86 servers, uh, you know, all the intelligence is built into the software. And it's built to scale out. It's it's built to heal itself if something's if something's not right. If you have a failure, uh, you know, even in terms of your security, it's built built to heal itself. And of course, then the the automation and the analytics that we were able to provide. And we've done that based upon uh, the framework that that a lot of companies have done prior to uh, Nutanix. And you know, some of our founders come from some of these companies, and so uh, we have a rich uh, heritage in which to work from. So the secret sauce with Nutanix is really uh, two things. It's our distributed storage fabric, uh, and that gives you the things like your snapshots, and your data locality, clones, tiering, compression, erasure coding, dedupe, resilience, and what we'll call the CVM. Yes, you'll see node one, node two, node n, and you're going to see a blue uh, uh, square in there that says CVM. That is a virtual machine. We call it the controller VM. And that's the brains of the operation. So every physical hardware node has a CVM. And all of the traffic and all of the things that go on within, within, your, within that hypervisor on that node go through the CVM. And that CVM talks to all the other CVMs across your Nutanix cluster. And all of the data that, is in, that resides in that CVM, all the pointer files, all, where everything is, is replicated across your cluster. So if a CVM dies, it's no big deal because you've got several others taking its place. Um, but these two things are really uh, what makes Nutanix how we do what we do. Uh, if, you're, if you're somewhat familiar with Nutanix, the distributed storage fabric used to be called the NDFS, the Nutanix Distributed uh, File System. Uh, but what we've done is we've just changed the name because it really is a better representation, right? We truly are a storage fabric that just scales as you need it to. Okay. Uh, now, when you talk about Nutanix, what are we talking about? Well, we're not really talking about hardware. Hardware is what it is. Nutanix has a great partnership with Lenovo that's been very well received uh, by Lenovo, uh, by the, not only Lenovo itself, but its resellers, uh, partners, and, and customers. Uh, but Nut Nutanix in and of itself is a software company, and we, and we we really have two pieces to the puzzle. We have our PRISM uh, interface, which you're going to see in a little bit, and that does your, your infrastructure management and gives you the operational insights that you need and allows you to do some planning. That's the GUI. Okay. And the Acropolis piece is everything that takes place behind the scenes, that application mobility fabric that gives me the ability to move apps across my uh, cluster, across Nutanix clusters, across hypervisors. Okay, it's the Acropolis hypervisor itself. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, we have the ability, uh, we work with VMware, we work with uh, Hyper-V, uh, but Nutanix uh, earlier uh, in the year, actually towards the end of last year, we released a version of KVM called Acropolis. What we've done is we've hardened it, we've made it uh, enterprise friendly, and we've put a nice front end GUI on it. If you've done anything with KVM in the past, it was all command line. Uh, we've taken, we've taken the, the need for that out. And then we have the distributed storage fabric, which I just covered a few minutes ago. So we have the concept, uh, when it comes to storage, we have two things. We have uh, storage pools and containers. Um, and a storage pool is all of the media within your cluster. That means your spinning hard drives. That means your solid state drives. And every Nutanix node, every physical node, physical server in the um, in the environment is going to have a mixture of solid state and spinning media. Uh, 
Now, as our as our uh, platforms uh, change, with, particularly with the uh, the Broadwell uh, products coming out this summer, you'll see additional uh, features. But don't be misled. You're going to hear a lot of you hear a lot of people in in it's mainly the large uh, large storage vendors who tell you uh, solid state or flash. All flash arrays, that's the best thing in the world. Everybody needs that. And the fact is they don't. I've worked, for sto I've worked in the storage industry a good chunk of my career. Um, and the, the, the reality is, is that most organizations don't need all flash systems. Uh, what they need is intelligent tiering. Because, frankly, if you look at most of the data in your environment, you're not, you're not needing all of your data sitting on, uh, you know, what I'll call tier one storage, right? You want data that's hot, that's that's constantly being accessed. Uh, you might want data that's being written to go to all flash, but after a time, you don't necessarily want it there. You just want it what you need there when you need it. And so we use intelligent tiering. So all of the storage is going to go in a single storage pool, both both spinning media and flash. And then we have containers. Now containers, um, what containers are are individual virtual, if you will, uh, blocks of storage that are presented up to the hypervisor as a data store. And so uh, within that pool of, of storage, I'm going to say this container X belongs to this data store in VMware uh, or Hyper-V or whatever. So all of it in there in one, but then you're going to have these virtual uh, buckets, if you will, and those buckets allow you to segment off departments, workloads, customers. If you are a, a service provider, you know, those containers allow you to separate people uh, so their data isn't coexisting, if you will. It's, it's safe and it's a good, uh, a good way to ensure that you can really separate workloads because Nutanix really thrives, you know, when we size you out, we want to size you out based on the workload, right? And so we might talk about Exchange and SQL and an Oracle or, or any of those things, and those are going to have their own containers within that storage pool. So uh, when you think about storage, the storage pool again, all the media containers are virtual uh, containers inside of that storage pool. Now, how do we write data? Uh, the data is, is really simple. The guest VMs are going to uh, write and read. They're always going to try to do it locally first. Okay, what I mean that is this is what we talk about our data locality. Data is going to be written locally, and then it's going to replicate uh, as once it's written. Okay, so it's going to write, um, and then it will replicate blocks of data randomly across uh, the rest of the nodes in the cluster. And this is in case we have a failure, uh, the data is replicated out there. Okay, and the, the read is very similar. It's going to read first locally, and we're going to assume that everything you know there's, it's going to find its local copies. Uh, and it will go uh, to the VM as requested. Um, now, what happens if a VM moves? Well, that VM moves, so it's gone from node A to node C, and it says, okay, I've got one block of data that I need, but the other two were back on the other, uh, on the other node. So I'm going to copy those pieces of data over to uh, this, this new node where I'm running. Well, what happened if that node had have died? Well, it simply would have gone to node B because you see that it already had copies of those on node B as well. Okay, so again, when we talk about uh, Nutanix, some of the, the, the features that we have, whether snapshots, clones, tiering, uh, disk balancing, compression, dedupe, of, you know, these are all important things, but the locality is very important, you know, again, we always want to make sure people say, well, you have to go across the network. You have to go. Now, we always read and write locally first, and we only go across the network when we don't have everything we need, and, and the CVM is going to be the one to make that determination. Um, we have the ability to pin uh, VMs, uh, and not only pin workloads into Flash. Uh, so let's say you wanted to run Oracle. Well, you can tell all of Oracle's data to reside in your hot tier, in your, in your Flash tier, so we can do those things. And then if you're familiar with erasure coding or if you're not, it's a great uh, technology. You can look this up. But basically when, when Nutanix replicates, we have uh, – I'm sure it replicates. When we, when, for redundancy, we have two 
we have what we call RF2, which is two copies of my data, or RF3, which is three copies, okay? And when you have RF2, you're basically saying, uh, if I have 100 uh, terabytes of disk and I'm gonna use RF2, I'm gonna lose 50% of that. I'm gonna lose 50 terabytes for copies, okay? Um, RF3 means uh, I'm going to lose, uh, you know, more. What erasure coding does is it allows you to recover some of that space because it's similar uh, to the idea of RAID. Now, we don't use RAID, but it's similar to the idea of RAID in that we're gonna use parity groups. And so we're actually able to get away from, um, get away from actually losing half uh, through that. And that's an option that you have to turn on that's all included. Oh, and oh, by the way, all of these things are included in, in your, the license, it's nothing you have to go out and piece part it together. Um, but we do have different licensing tiers, and I, you guys may have seen that at the last one, but I think we're gonna talk about that a little bit here too. But I did talk about earlier the, the tiering process, how not everybody needs uh, all flash or uh, all spinning. You know, there's, there has to be some happy medium in there, so how do we get to that point? Um, very simply put, we look at how often data is accessed. Uh, if a piece of data is accessed three times in an hour, uh, we're gonna wanna put that up in the hot tier and that's gonna be done behind the scenes. You're not gonna have to do anything, it just happens. Uh, if something is not accessed three times in an hour and historically is not accessed you know, three times, it's gonna, then it's gonna be migrated down into the spinning tier. And this is what allows you uh, to get tremendous performance without wasting space uh, on that performance tier. Now, uh, there will be times, you know, th there could be a time where somebody needs an all-flash system. Well, um, like I say, coming up this summer, uh, uh, the Nutanix on Lenovo will have the ability to have an all-flash uh, system. But most, you know, the vast majority of Nutanix customers, uh, doesn't matter who the, who the, the hardware vendor is, uh, don't need it because intelligent tiering gives them the performance that they need. And it's, and it's quite cost effective when you do it this way. Okay, we talked about locality. This is the idea of keeping all of the data on the same node as the VM, but you're, only, you're replicating the pieces that you need to uh, for that uh, redundancy. And the salt locality also keeps it off of the network, right? Uh, we don't wanna flood the network, we want the, the network to be there in case we need to replicate, in case we need to uh, recover from a, an outage or something, but we don't want the network to be uh, responsible for, for just regular uh, back and forth traffic. That should be done locally. Okay, the idea of disk balancing, uh, you know, the cool thing about Nutanix is we, we don't necessarily need all the nodes in a cluster to be the same. You know, when you buy a Nutanix cluster from day one, your, your first three nodes need to be the same. Uh, but after that, you add, you build on to your Nutanix cluster one, one node at a time. And maybe that's a storage heavy node, maybe it's a, a performance heavy node, doesn't matter. The cluster is gonna look at what's available I and mean, it's, it's going to avoid having hotspots by intelligently balancing the data. Uh, and this is where the CVMs kick in, right? They're, they're, looking at, they're looking across the cluster, they know the performance, or they know the characteristics of the cluster of the nodes and they're gonna be able to, you know, leveraging uh, the MapReduce framework uh, without having any uh, intervention from you, it's going to spread the data across so it's very evenly distributed and no one node is working harder than the other. The dedupl yeah, deduplication, you know, this is something that's been around for quite a while, uh, but we uh, have what we call the inline fingerprinting, okay, we're looking um, I see some questions come across. I'm gonna pause here in a minute and I'll get to those. Uh, I'm in full screen mode, so I can't see your, <laughs> can't see your questions, but hold on. Um, so deduplication, we've got an inline mode where it's going to look at all the data coming across um, and it can, it can strip out the, the duplicate pieces, but it can also do what's called a post process. And we're leveraging a number of different technologies to do this. Um, and uh, uh, when you look at it's actually quite a bit, it's, it's very impressive the amount of data that you can, can recover. Now, I've had it asked a number hey, of times, but what, what's my ratio? Yeah, go ahead, sorry. I have a question that came up, says, uh, 
How much resources do you have to dedicate for the CVM on each node? Doesn't it require a minimum of 32 gig RAM at a starting point? No, it does not require a minimum of 32. Um, so the, the amount of memory uh, depends on what you're going to be doing, okay? So if you're going to be doing erasure coding, uh, if you're going to be doing a node that's heavy database, uh, you might want to. So what happens is when we do um, sizing uh, for Nutanix cluster, um, we're going to look at a number of, of things. We don't size based on what we're replacing. We size on, on what's the workload. Uh, and then uh, when we have, when we look at um, things like deduplication, compression, erasure coding, this is where we're going to uh, determine how much memory uh, we're going to allocate. And the nice thing is with the CVM, you can change that at any time, right? Uh, but 32, no, you don't have to start at 32. Um, you might get to 32, but you don't have to start there. It just really, it really does depend on, on the workload. There's no, there's no uh, right or wrong answer. It's, 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 it's customer specific and workload specific. And if you find that you're not getting the performance you need, then you can you know, work with support. But you know, you can go in there and change that memory allocation, and, and it, it's very easy to do. Okay, so compression, um, again, inline and post-process uh, comp compression. Uh, this is really one of those things, it's an either or, right? You're either gonna compress or you're gonna use deduplication. Uh, but the neat thing is here, when you compress, uh, there's no impact uh, to, to the normal IO path. Uh, you know, it's, it's ideal really for, for random workloads. And, and this is the cool thing about Nutanix, right? We can have random workloads, we can have predictable workloads, and this is why we give you the ability to do compression or dedupe or any number of things, right? It just depends on your particular workload because we know particular workloads have um, certain things that we expect from them, right? We expect uh, random uh, vice predictable workloads to have different characteristics, and so uh, we give you everything that you're used to but, but allow you to, to tweak them. And, you know, you might have, um, you might have several different uh, different technologies in use depending on workloads. So I have one workload running Exchange, so I might do something for that. I have another workload uh, running uh, a SQL, and I have uh, different characteristics for that. It, some workloads I might have replicating, uh, you know, RF2. Some workloads I might have RF3. Uh, so again, we have these different uh, different things. Uh, compression ratios, you know, it really depends, um, but you know, on average. Uh, you can see here your typical workloads, VDI, Hadoop, private cloud. Uh, these things typically are giving us what we've seen from our customers um, have been around 78% uh, reduction. Uh, and again, this is, you can't just pick out one customer and say then this is the average, um, what we're seeing. Okay, so erasure coding. Again, you're familiar with RAID, uh, RAID 5, RAID 6, RAID DP. Um, you know, there's a lot of wasted space, if you will, hot spares, and this was basically a hardware defined. And so, uh, if you look at erasure coding, and you know what the what the web scale uh, data centers of the world are doing, uh, they they don't use RAID. They use uh, they use this the idea of erasure coding that gives you uh, gives you resiliency. Uh, it, it uses the entire cluster. Uh, it gives you fast rebuilds. Um, and, and again, the idea is you're using parity bits. Um, sorry. And I don't know if I don't, I don't remember if I have a, a specific slide on erasure coding in here, but this is actually something that's it's kind of a deeper discussion. But again, if you're having, uh, if you want to recover some of that data that, or that disk space that you would lose uh, by your your redundancy factor, erasure coding is is a way to recover that. Now. Um, the, the standard, or I should say the Nutanix cluster to start with, you need to have three nodes minimum. If you want to use erasure coding, you need a minimum of four nodes, okay, because you need that, that room for the parity bits. If you want to use two-factor replication, RF2, that's a three-node cluster minimum. If you want to use RF3, you need 
uh, five nodes. Okay, then this this allows you again to loop, you can lose more nodes that way. But um, another thing I want to make sure that, that we understand. Uh, well, actually, I'll get into that in just a sec. But um, this goes a little bit deeper into uh, what's going to happen when you use erasure coding um, and some of the the, uh, the benefits of it. Again, you're recovering a certain amount of space. Uh, the customers that I've worked with uh, to date, about half use erasure coding. Um, it, it doesn't appear to really have any overhead associated with it. Um, you know, not that I've heard, uh, nor nor customers have reported back. So, uh, really, it's 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 an it's an advantageous thing to do. But again, it does take an additional node if you're starting off with a three node cluster you need in a fourth node. Okay, so uh, recovering data or data availability, as I like to say, uh, we have uh, different uh, ways to tackle that, uh, whether it's uh, you know, asynchronous replication, whether it's asynchronous or what we'll call metro cluster, uh, whether it's connecting uh, to the cloud, uh, backing up somewhere else. Uh, uh, our partnership with Commvault uh, gives people a lot of uh, options, uh, but we have multiple ways to ensure that your data is available and recovered. And so what we like to say is for major incidents and minor incidents, we have two different things. So, um, you know, if I need to recover on minutes or hours, uh, I'm going to use, uh, and those are what we would call minor incidents. I'm going to use uh, something called time stream, which is, again, it's, our, it's built into our product. You don't pay extra for it. And our cloud connect, the ability to, uh, and our cloud connect, what that allows you to do is it allows you to go to Amazon uh, or Azure and actually uh, copy, if you will, copy uh, VM data up to those repositories. But for major incidents, as we all know, you know, if you're recovering uh, across the wire, that can be uh, time consuming. So for major incidents, that's where we're going to do things like synchronous and asynchronous replication. Now, the biggest, uh, the biggest consideration here, uh, synchronous replication to another Nutanix cluster uh, means that uh, I have less than a five millisecond round trip time. Uh, this can be a challenge for you know, a lot of organizations, but for those that have the bandwidth, uh, this can, sure, can ensure that you're always on because, well, you've got darn near near zero uh, recovery time. It's 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 continuously updating and it's real time. So, uh, but asynchronous replication is also uh, an option. This is probably our most common. Okay, so uh, local snapshots, uh, time stream. Uh, this is going to protect you against your guest OS corruption. Uh, you know, it's going to give users the ability to file level restore, uh, which is uh, new uh, in our in this version of, of the Nutanix product. Uh, you know, VM. We, we're going down to the VM in terms of of protecting the snapshots. There's no performance uh, impact, which is which is nice because there's a lot of a lot of things out there from from different companies that you know these snapshots uh, will impact local performance, uh, not a problem. Um, and lower and lower cost per gig uh, with the storage heavy uh, nodes. So you will find with Nutanix, particularly with Lenovo, we have we have three models today. We have the HX3500, which is your kind of standard compute heavy compute node, the 5500, which is going to be your storage heavy node. And then the 7500, which is going to be, well, I'll call that our tier one node, which is if you have large SQL deployments or large exchange deployments or things like that, uh, that will be the 7500. But um, really, you know, when you're when you're dealing with storage only nodes, you can get some really good uh, uh, lower cost per gig in some of those. Again, rep, uh, asynchronous replication. Uh, one thing I really appreciate about uh, Nutanix is the ability to replicate uh, many to many, uh, one to many many to one, uh, all those features, and this is under our uh, data protection category. Now this is using Nutanix technology to replicate. You're not having to use VMware, you're not having to use uh, Microsoft or whatever, uh, but it only, it, you know, you're using Nutanix when you're going from Nutanix cluster to Nutanix cluster. If you're going from a three-tier architecture to 
to a Nutanix cluster, then you're going to use the you know a third party tool like VMware or something like that to actually replicate. But when you're using Nutanix to Nutanix, um, you're using Nutanix technologies to, to manage that replication. And then we talked about um, metro availability, um, and this is again using uh, five seconds or five millisecond or less round trip time, uh, the ability to keep things synced up in case you have an outage. So all your VMs will, will just fire up uh, on the secondary site and you'll be up and running. Uh, and this is going to uh, give you that protection against the, an entire site failure. Um, and uh, one thing I want to point out is really under the, the points of differentiation uh, is our, our APIs. Uh, and I was, I'm going to show you uh, in the, the demo, our APIs are wide open. Uh, you can go in there, you can look, you can customize, you can do whatever. That, when nothing's hidden. Uh, if you want to see how, how open Nutanix is, I would encourage you to go to the website NutanixBible.com. So NutanixBible.com. It's written by Stephen Poitras. He's our uh, senior architect at Nutanix. This project has been going on for several years. It's got the blessing of, of our CEO on down uh, because we don't want you to you know, just buy a box and trust us, right? We want you to know what's taking place in the covers. And so you can get really, really deep in the weeds um, by spending some time on NutanixBible.com, but you will come away with a much better understanding, particularly after you see today, uh, if you saw the first one, uh, then when you read the Nutanix Bible, it'll make a lot more sense to you and you'll have a lot greater uh, depth he gives some great video uh, presentations, some whiteboards, uh, lots of good diagrams that kind of tell you what piece talks to what piece. Okay, I mentioned the Nutanix Cloud Connect. This is where we are uh, getting in and being able to actually touch and, and deposit data uh, inside of uh, whether it's AWS or uh, Azure, okay? But this is really gonna be for archiving and backup purposes. We're not talking about bursting, you know, uh, bursting VMs to the to the cloud, right? We're just talking about archiving a backup. Okay, so for resiliency, uh, talking multiple data paths, uh, tunable redundancy, right? You can decide whether you're going to use uh, RF2, RF3, depending on uh, your cluster characteristics. Uh, the workload may require a different, uh, you know, where different workloads require different uh, replication factors. And then uh, we're always going to be doing integrity checks uh, to ensure that what we are, what we, the policies that we set up, uh, particularly around security uh, and, and everything else that's involved there are uh, constantly uh, where we want them to be. So uh, when we talk about tunable redundancy, we, we talked earlier, you know, I mentioned the RF2, RF3, you know, RF2, you need a minimum of three nodes. Uh, RF3, you need a minimum of five nodes. Uh, and again, this is just to give you the ability to have more failures within your, your cluster. What's important about this is that if you have workloads, let's say I can build you a cluster today that you can very comfortably do in three nodes, uh, but you have workloads that you think will be, um, that you, you might want one or two of them to be protected with that third copy, then you're gonna wanna go ahead and buy the other two nodes. So you're gonna go ahead and start off with a five node cluster. Uh, because that's going to give you the ability uh, to have some nodes running at RF3 and other nodes running at RF2. So this is what we mean by it's being tunable. Okay, our CVM autopathing. So again, remember I talked about our secret sauce being the uh, distributed storage fabric and then our guest VMs, or oh, no, sorry, guest VMs, I'm sorry, I'm looking right out of here, controller VMs. Uh, guess I need more coffee. Uh, our controller VMs are the guys going to handle all of the traffic, right? And when a controller VM fails, if it fails, uh, what happens? Well, nothing happens because uh, it's just that VM that died. We have this controller VM is, is – all controller VMs are all the same. They all have the same data. They know who was who what resides where. And so uh, what is going to happen is the guest VM is still going to access um, – it's still going to access its data. It's just going to go through another controller VM to get that data. Right? It's not going to have any impact on your performance. It's not going to have any impact on your cluster. It's just simply uh, allowing you to continue to run uh, without interruption. Again, that's the beauty of having 
these CVMs replicated and talking to each other. Okay, so uh, when we talk about networking uh, in Acropolis, it's very similar to other, other VM type of, of uh, networks uh, that you may set up. Um, but now we get into what we talk about, the application mobility fabric. And this is the ability, again, to allow apps to move back and forth between uh, not only clusters, nodes, but even in between different hypervisors. Okay, so, and this is actually, uh, this might be, if you guys are interested, we could actually do a version three of this and focus a whole lot of time on just the application mobility fabric itself and the networking components. But the networking is, is pretty straightforward for networking people, right? Uh, but the idea is, is this app mobility fabric is the whole thing, why Nutanix does what we do. Um, think about it, think about it in terms of your phone. Uh, I don't know if you're an iPhone guy, if you're a, an Android guy, uh, I even saw a guy in the plane the other day had a BlackBerry. Um, so that's actually the second BlackBerry I've seen in the year. Um, but doesn't, it shouldn't matter what your, your hardware platform is of choice. What you really care about is the app, right? Uh, I want to know that if I go to, to – uh, if like I'm, I'm going on a plane ride today later, so I don't know if I want to go to southwest.com, whether I'm using my, my phone or my wife's phone or, or my kid's phone, I can go pull, log on and pull up my account and get what I need done. And the idea is uh, if I switch over to an Android and download the Southwest app, I should be able to pull up my data. The, the underlying platform doesn't work. Very, very similar concept here. And then the networking is going to be what's, what's important to that. Um, uh, the application mobility fabric, so that we say AMF, the IP address management, right? We're going to have an integrated DHCP server. Acropolis is going to be the, the management of that. Um, and so there will be a lot of things going on in the background that you don't necessarily have to manage. What you do have to manage is you do have to set up, uh, you see here, create networks. You are going to have to set up VLANs, uh, and you're going to have to decide whether you want IP address management and set up. But this is all, this is all GUI driven. This is not command line. Uh, frankly, you really don't need to be a networking guy. You probably want to work with your networking guys to set this up. But it's pretty straightforward, and it's, this is all functionality built right into, right into the GUI. And I'll, uh, I'll try to show you where this is in the GUI later. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll move on from this here. High availability. Uh, do I want to, uh, you know, turn that on? Uh, all kinds of different options that, that we have. Uh, what we want to do is we want to make sure that uh, if there is a, a VM failure, uh, we want to make sure that it auto restarts. Uh, you can enable this policy through the PRISM interface. Um, and, you know, again, we're reducing administrator overhead. Uh, this is key. I've heard time and time again from uh, from Nutanix customers that the, the number one thing did is we gave them back their life uh, because what we allowed them to do is focus on managing uh, apps rather than focusing on managing infrastructure. Okay, so if I can have – if I can set all these policies up ahead of time, uh, that's reduced uh, in, in administrator overhead because it's just being managed automatically by the system. And, of course, my VMs are, uh, will say, always on. Okay. So all of this comes out of the idea of building uh, enterprise-grade engineering with the hardware, with the software that's designed to do all this for you, but keeping it as simple as, again, using your uh, phone. Okay, simplified data center management. We want to have one-click infrastructure management, uh, one-click planning, uh, one-click operational insights, because we're going to allow you to manage the cluster and the storage of VMs, uh, capacities, uh, search, alerts, all this is, is done uh, through the PRISM interface. Again, that's what we like to say, uh, one click. So, uh, you know, we're always looking to solve, uh, you know, a problem ahead of time uh, with, through our self-healing, right? Uh, we want to be intent-based, understanding uh, the intention, accomplish what we want to do with a single click without having to go to five different screens to do it. Um, and opinionated, frankly, right? We want to make sure that um, we give you the right set of choices to make uh, without, you know, without having everything on the menu. Um, uh, I think the best way to think about this is I've seen, I used to work for a company. Uh, I think that the way they, they felt that data center management should be done is to make it as complex as possible so you have to pay for six months of services and then th two months of training just to run it. Um, 
well, why not look at the, the features that say the top 10 or the top 50 features or the top 100 features that every administrator is going to want to do and put those in the GUI. But for those things that you almost never do as an administrator, leave the functionality in there, but just put it in the, the interface, the, uh, the uh, command line interface. And so that's what we do is, we, is, you know, we've talked to customer after customer after customer, understand what the need is, and uh, put those features into the GUI. And uh, as we add new features, uh, those new features go into the CLI, and then uh, and the next time we have a major release goes in, those features then uh, get migrated up into the GUI. Um, very well, very very well received by our our customer base, and we do it with a, com a consumer grade design, an easy interface to manage. Um, you know, I can look here, and I'm going to go through the tour uh, when we do the demo. But the idea is here: we want this to be something that you can look at, you can get information from. It doesn't; it's not an eye chart, uh, but it gives you the information that you need. Okay. Uh, we wanted you to be able to, to look at the configuration, the health, see if there any risks, and, and how efficient is my system running. I want to be able to manage multiple clusters across the globe uh, using that single interface. I want to be able to run upgrades with a single click um, through, through the Prism interface you see there. Uh, Upgrade software. Uh, these things are all point and click, and I'll and I'll show you this in the in the uh, demo as well. But again, it's designed to be uh, simple. We don't want to have to uh, make this difficult. You know, I, I look at here the one click upgrade. Uh, I don't know the the background of everybody in the call, but when I started off in in the storage world in '99, I to that point I had been a a, a Unix admin, uh, and then I, got, I went into the storage arena and. I used to love to talk to customers about upgrades and migrations and all this stuff, and we'd build we'd build very elaborate plans. And uh, one particular customer here in uh, in in Central Florida, um, they they allow one day a month for uh, anything any type of hardware swap outs. Their data centers locked down, armed guards, uh, except for one day a month, which I find interesting. Um, and if you want to get in there other times, then you have to, it has to go through executive committee approval. It's just their data is their lifeblood, and any kind of issue would, would frankly kill the company. So, um, you know, so even scheduling upgrades could be very painful. They'd have to, they would literally not allow people to take uh, vacations. They would have maintenance teams on standby. They would have, I mean, you name it. It's like I got to add more hardware and I got to do this uh, only at, at a particular time. What if I could just sit back and do it from my pool? Well, that's that's kind of the basis of the one-click upgrade. Is I can log log on, I can see what needs to be upgraded, and I click the button, and then it goes through a rolling process of upgrading the software, done in minutes, no downtime. And the cool part is, is that I can actually uh, know I, I will know because of the the system checks that take place whether it's even safe to do. And if it's not safe, the system's not going to upgrade. All right? It's it's going through this process. Once everybody says, yes, we're good, it passes all the integrity checks, all the checksums are done, then it clicks over and you're running the new the new version. If not, nothing happens. But this is all done from a remote console. It's very easy, uh, done in a GUI. Okay? And we like to say it's as simple as upgrading an iPhone. What did your app? Upgrade it. Done. So that comes to the end of the uh, that's the end of the presentation portion. Uh, so it took us 48 minutes. That's not bad. Um, while I uh, flip over to the demo, do we have any uh, questions? Haven't seen any come in in the chat win chat window. Hmm. Okay. So I'm going to flip over now. Um, and this is a so this demo I'm going to show you is I'm going to just go through and show you various uh, portions of the uh, Nutanix uh, interface here. Um, so I'm going to take just I'm going to take a 30 second break here and grab a, a water. So uh, just bear with me. Uh, 
Okay. So what you're seeing here, and can you can you uh, see my uh, screen? Should say present we can. Until four six. Okay, good. It does. So what this is, this is an HTML5 GUI that uh, you can access. Uh, I think, frankly, any browser works. At least I've tried Safari, works fine. Uh, this is Google Chrome. Uh, Firefox works fine. Uh, I haven't, actually haven't tried it on Internet Explorer yet, but, you know, we might get there one of these days. And I, and I make a big deal out of this GUI for the simple fact that I came from a company. I don't know. I'm not going to say the name just because I don't want to insult anybody. Uh, but I came from a company that had a storage product that used a Java GUI that you dropped on your desktop, and it was very it was very user unfriendly. But more importantly, it had so many uh, variables that you had to make sure that were running on your desktop that it you couldn't run it on a Mac, for example, um, which is which is fine. But what if you're at home and you're you know your your PC at work, but your Mac at home, but you still need to work from home? I mean, there were so many variables, and it even depending on your monitor, it may not even uh, it may not even display properly. Uh, I like the fact that Nutanix went with an HTML5 web-based interface because you can use anything to access it from anywhere. And so what I have here, have here is a, um, I've got a, uh, uh, an interface into uh, some of our production clusters. So there's some things I'm not going to be able to do because these are production machines that are running. Uh, but I use this because I want you to see the, the, the uh, the ease of management of multiple clusters uh, from one interface. So again, this is our our, our login. I'm going to uh, just put my stuff in here. Now I'm sitting in, just to give you an idea of, of the, the time that this is taking, I'm sitting uh, actually at the airport in Orlando, Florida, using my phone as my wireless hotspot going back to this data center uh, residing in San Jose, California. So the, 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 the time is, is pretty, uh, pretty good. Um, if you look here, this is what we're, this is our Prism uh, Central, and this gives us a lot of information here. You, Let's look at, uh, there's some, some uh, if I click on home, I'm going to see uh, right away there's some, there's some uh, alerts that are popping up here I've got going on. I'm going to see my cluster CPU average, okay, or, or I should say cluster, these are all clusters. So Metro A is a cluster, uh, Infra 01 t uh, TMP is a cluster, Infra 03 is a cluster. These are all different clusters, and you can see the average CPU utilization of the cluster itself. Uh, the cluster runway, I'm going to come back and talk about that in just a second because this is a really good feature that has been very valuable in the short time that's been available. Um, the uh, cluster memory utilization, so I can see within my cluster how much uh, memory I'm using. I can see the, the trends that are taking place. Uh, cluster storage, uh, latency. Uh, any tasks that are going on, what succeeded, what failed, and then controller IOPS. This is where I see and go to multiple clusters, if you will. So, uh, like, for example, if I wanted to explore, uh, I could say that, you know, within, uh, you know, within, uh, I've got uh, 1,213, so 1,213 total VMs uh, in my Nutanix environment across all my clusters because it shows me that I've got seven clusters. Uh, and, and if I look in this cluster screen, uh, it tells me I've got ESX, I've got the first three are ESXi, the fourth one is the Acropolis hypervisor, uh, then I have uh, two more ESXi, and then finally um, one more Acropolis hypervisor. And then you can see here how many hosts I have in the cluster. Those are physical nodes, and then how many VMs per cluster. So I can get a lot of information here. Uh, I can look at the physical hosts, uh, their IP addresses and get all those things. I can look at the disks. Uh, I can get all kinds of information. Now, this is a lot of I stuff here, and I, I get that. Um, I can show a list of the containers, uh, again, across the cluster, uh, what replication factor I'm using. So you can see here the name, then the RF, but I'm using RF2, RF3. It looks like most of these are RF2 to this point. Um, the compression I'm using, uh, performance tier DDoP. So 
we can we can uh, deduplicate data that sits on the hot tier, the performance tier, or the on disk, the spinning media tier. Uh, you can do both. Uh, whether I'm using erasure coding or not, and then uh, you know how much storage I have free. So this is just uh, you know one area. Uh, but one thing I want to do is I want to go back here to cluster runway for a minute while we're here. Um, what cluster runway does is it tells me based off of uh, utilization, I have how much time until I need more resources. And so what you see here is this particular cluster runway says that I'm going to run out of storage in about 15 days. Okay, so you can see this, this uh, dotted line here. Okay, um, let's see, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but uh, you can see this, these different colors, right? It tells you uh, where you're at. Um, it, it tells me, you know, I've got snapshot utilization, uh, different different things. When I click on it, different times it will tell me the characteristics of of what's going on. Uh, you can see here. Uh, so, you know, back on uh, probably 312 when this started up, there was nothing. 314 started to creep up. And what happened was these these VMs were consuming the storage and such that based off of current usage, uh, I've got I've got 15 days left. Okay. Now my CPU runway is a little different. I, I have more time based on current utilization. How much is going on? I can see here that I've got more time with my CPU and my memory uh, is is currently not at all a critical stage. In fact, I've got more than 43 days on it. So if I go back to storage real quick, I just want to look at some recommendations. Um, you know, it, it's going to, you know, you're going to look here and say, okay, all these VMs have not been powered on for more than 30 days. So the question then is, these VMs which are, you know, taking up space, do they need to even be there? That's a question we might want to ask. Um, you know, uh, I could expand, it tells me, say, recommendation number two. So recommendation number one is, uh, do these VMs need to be there? Recommendation number two might be, uh, do I want to add a node? You know, if I want to expand my cluster, um, you know, I could go out there and pull it. Now, this is one of those, uh, there, are, there are no new nodes in this cluster for me to discover, but if there were, uh, I could simply just point click done. So I mean, again, taking a physical node, put it in my environment, uh, plugging it in, turning it on, and then I would use the expansion to uh, make that cluster larger. Um, but the other thing I can do is I can do some estimations too. Okay, so uh, existing workload sizes. Um, actually, let me cancel this here. What I can do is say, let's say, uh, let's bump out to 50. You know, let's say 55 days or or uh, go to 90 days. Okay. There's inf insufficient data to predict that far into the future. Pre pre please predict less than 44 days. Okay, so let's just say 20 days. Okay, it's basically telling me uh, use the existing workload for the size estimation. Size, size estimation. Okay, so uh, tells me the node. Now this is I know we're we're a Lenovo audience today. Uh, this particular node is a Nutanix node, uh, but th this would be the same whether you're running Nutanix, uh, Lenovo, or anybody else. You're going to get the same information, just a different model. Okay. So that's the runway, and this is a hugely valuable thing for customers to get an idea when they're going to have a lot of space. And this is good for you guys, too, because, uh, you know, you'll know when you need to, um, you know, when you need to talk to your customer or your, your reseller about, you know, expanding a cluster. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go actually to uh, go to a particular cluster, and this is what we're going to call uh, our prism element. And what that is is the, the prism element. This is where we manage individual um, Nutanix uh, clusters themselves. Just take a second for it to come up here. So you've got again, you've got the prism central, which allows you to uh, view multiple clusters with information about all those clusters, and then we go to the individual uh, prism uh, interface for that particular cluster. 
So uh, let's just do a quick, uh, you know, view here from, from left to right. I've got my hypervisor summary tells me I'm running a 5.5 of ESXi. I've got uh, 12, roughly 12 terabytes free space out of, out of the almost 15 that I had. I've got 44 VMs, tells you the various states that they're in. I've got four hosts. Uh, again, this is an Intantanix model. Uh, but again, if, if you were on Lenovo or anybody else, you would see that particular information there. Uh, it would give me cluster, uh, hypervisor IOPS, uh, give me latencies, CPU utilizations, memory. Uh, so lots of basic information right to that. So the first thing let's do, let's go to storage. Because this is the one everybody you know kind of wonders about, right? Is, okay, I see my storage here. Uh, I can see that there's uh, uh, all the things that are going on here. Let's go over to a diagram. I can see a few things. I can see my uh, usage. I can see my performance. Uh, summary, and then the, you know, the various uh, things that are taking place at that time. Uh, but what happens if we go over to table here, uh, and I can see uh, containers, I can see storage pool. So the containers, if you remember, were the, uh, these were the various uh, virtual buckets, if you will, that get presented to the hypervisor as a data store. Uh, and I can see here I've got uh, uh, 41 containers on this particular post. If I go up here, I can just uh, click through those. If I go to uh, the VMs, again, I can see uh, information about my VM, 44 VMs. Uh, I've got 231 provision uh, vCPUs, uh, 40 gig uh, uh, reserved in CPU. Let's go over to table here so I can break this out a little more. I'm going to get a list of those VMs. Okay, so let's look here. Uh, for example, I see demo or BG demo one. So if I click on that one, I'm going to get the specifics and specific information about that. Uh, I'm going to it's going to find out what host, what physical host that resides on, the IP address. It'll give me my my guest operating system, and of course all the the various pieces about um, about that. Now. If I click on another one, uh, I'm going to get the same type of, of information, okay, but it needs to be uh, turned on to see that. But then you can see here, C CPU utilization, uh, memory, hypervisor IOPS, hypervisor bandwidth, uh, latency, uh, CPU uh, ready time. Let me uh, make one of these a little bigger here. So you can see here, I can, I can take uh, and I can really expand and try to understand what's happening in my environment uh, just by looking at these analytics uh, and then I can and make some smart decisions that way. Let's look at uh, hardware for a moment. Now again, I'm, again this is a, a Nutanix node, but it really doesn't matter uh, because you're gonna get the same information. So uh, think of, when we talk about this, let's think of host, physical servers. Uh, if I look here uh, in my diagram, uh, doesn't matter what I have. Uh, if if this is a Lenovo node, you're going to see the same thing. You're going to see the Lenovo server. You're going to see the disk drives that are there. You're going to see the power supplies. So I could say, okay, uh, let me click on that disk, and I click on that disk, and I can see down here in the lower left-hand corner the serial number of that disk, who mates it. Uh, it's in the the solid state uh, drive. I've I've got a physical capacity of uh, you know, 228 gig, uh, I'm using 18 gig, I'm sorry, 183 gig. Um, so I can get all this information about it. Uh, you know, I click down here and I'm now on a, a spinning drive, right? So, and it gives me all the information, same type of information. Um, you can click on disk usage, disk performance, disk alerts, and get all that, the things, that, again, that we wanted to see. Okay, you know, what's happening here? Why are we having these spikes like this? Uh, pretty common across the board right about the same time. What happens if we click on the individual node? I can see CPU utilization, uh, you know, memory usage. Uh, all the things that I might want to see as a manager, I can look at this and very quickly understand what I'm looking at and, and understand where I need to take uh, action. Let's look at uh, data protection. Data protection is what allows me to, to again, uh, make sure that my data is safe. Now, uh, what I've seen here, I see I've got nine remote sites. I've got uh, 
I've got 60 protected domains and four uh, metro uh, clusters. Okay, there's seven pending actions. Uh, so let's uh, let's dig down a little bit here. I'm just going to load up the information here. Okay, so you can see here uh, asynchronous DR tells you you know uh, the the policy that I have. Okay, it's the remote site that it's going to. The next, uh, you know, right now there's nothing really going on, but the next snapshot is going to be uh, today at, in four minutes, actually. Uh, it's going to take uh, 24 gig. Uh, so all the information is, is right right here in your fingertips. If I go to Metro Availability, um, it's going to tell you uh, what I have set up for that hot site. Okay, remember I talked about that uh, five millisecond or less round trip time. So I've got four sites that are available uh, to be used. And then, you know, my remote sites uh, it tells you, okay, I'm using physical mechanics. Here's one we're going to uh, Amazon. Uh, all kinds of different uh, pieces of information that I can gather. Uh, and again, this is all this is all set up right here in Prism uh, because this is a, a production cluster. I'm not going to be able to do as, as much as I'd like to uh, to show you, but you can see how easy it is to, to view it. Now, what does this look like? Since I can't demo this for you right now, I can at least tell you how it works. Is when it comes to, uh, you know, setting up data protection, I want to be able to go to the, let's say, go to the Amazon Cloud. So I'm going to say Cloud Connect, and I'm going to, uh, it's going to say, okay, do you going to want to go to Amazon or you want to go to Azure? And all you need to do that is your credentials for your account and a secret key or whatever that you need, whether it depends if it's, again, if it's Azure or Amazon, different things. But it is literally username, password, access key, done. And then your, your Nutanix cluster is joined right to the Amazon. But the only thing that's replicating is the specific pieces that you tell it to. So there might be some, uh, there might be some uh, workloads that you are backing up to the Amazon uh, cloud or to the Azure cloud, but other things you're doing a, you know, local backup of or, you know, hot site of, it just depends on the need. And this is the flexibility that Nutanix, uh, that we like to give you, okay. If I look at the alerts, I can see here the various things here. Uh, you know, we, we have info, critical, warning, uh, it just depends on what it is. Uh, snapshot retrieval for protection VM tells you, you know, failed. Basically tells you when it failed, um, and it tells you you know what you can do, what's the resolution, uh, you know resolve that the stated reason for the failure. If you cannot resolve the error, contact Nutanix support. Okay, so again, um, these things are are flexible. Uh, they're they're meant to be friendly. They're meant to be easily uh, found. I can I can set up uh, you know my email alerts uh, by default when you have an alert take place in the Nutanix system, if there's a failure of some kind, it's going to notify Nutanix tech support. Um, and then you set it up if you want to mail it yourself as well. And finally, uh, if I go to my health screen here, um, you're gonna see uh, how, how healthy am I, okay? You know, it looks, Looks like everything's relatively good. Uh, we got a few things here, like remote site. Uh, it's got some challenges going on here. One critical. Okay, so I can drill down and understand what's taking place there. So lots of different things that you can see uh, within the Nutanix system itself. Uh, but one thing I talked about earlier was the the openness of our of our APIs. And so if you come over here, uh, what you would normally see, and, and I can't show it to you right now, they, they really locked this down on me, um, is underneath the, the drop down here, you've got a number of things. You cluster details. If you were going to upgrade your uh, Nutanix cluster, this is where it would be. And you saw the, the screenshots earlier where you, you simply select your the, the thing that you want to upgrade. Uh, but you would also have here your your APIs listed, and you have a REST API browser. Um, and so that's something that you can drill down to. You can run tests of any API changes that you're going to make. You can you can give it various commands that you want to put in there. 
and it will execute. And again, because this is a live cluster, uh, I wanted you to have some data to, to view. Uh, but again, if you go back to, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, one other thing I would point out too, you see here how this is an ESXi hypervisor, um, you know, 5.5, and, and you see the various pieces of, of information. Um, but let me, you know, let me pick a, uh, I pick a cluster that's not ESX because I want you to see here um, that just because it's a different hypervisor, there's no learning curve. Uh, whether you have uh, ESX or, or Acropolis or Hyper-V, it all looks the same. The management is all the same. Um, and so there's no learning curve. It's simply uh, if you're running uh, ESX, you're going to be using uh, uh, VMware to do your, your VM management if you're using uh, uh, Hyper-V, you're going to use SCVMM. If you're going to use Acropolis, you're going to use uh, the PRISM interface. But all the information that you have available at your fingertips is the same across the board. So I hope that was, I hope that was useful to you, uh, you know, in understanding uh, the Nutanix product. Um, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very intuitive, it's very user-friendly. Um, again, you know, we have the, the command line interface, which is typically your, your newest features and features that aren't used every day by 99% of the administrators out there, and then the PRISM interface, uh, which is going to be the, the bulk of your time uh, based, on, again, on, on feedback. So uh, with that, do I, have any, uh, do I have any questions? I haven't had too many so far. Uh, there's none coming up in the chat window. If you, uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, go ahead and type it in the chat window and we'll get it answered. I'm not seeing anything pop up. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to put my uh, my contact information back up here. Yeah, um, uh, go back to the beginning here. I just want to let it sit here for a few minutes. Uh, again, I so I cover uh, the east coast of the U.S. So basically, if you divide the country down by the Mississippi, uh, that's me. I've got a counterpart, Reggie Allen. Uh, I don't know if he's on this call or not. Who's out of Portland, Oregon? He handles the West. Reggie and I are a virtual team, so. Uh, we cover for each other uh, all the time. Um, uh, my boss, uh, Juan Garcia, uh, is uh, he's out of Austin, Texas, and he's able to kind of go wherever and do whatever. Uh, and then also we have uh, Sam uh, Ducey, who's uh, kind of in charge for our, uh, our sales organization uh, for the Lenovo relationship. But please feel free to reach out to me directly. You can find me on Twitter. You can my blog. Uh, is mostly uh, Nutanix or, or tech-related postings. I, I'm frankly, I don't, I write about once a month on the blog, but, uh, you know, it gives me something to do on, on flights. But uh, any questions you have that I didn't cover today, please reach out to me. I'm more than happy to, uh, to help you. And uh, that's all I have for you guys. So thanks very much for allowing me to come on, and I hope to, uh, hope to see you guys out in the field. David, thank you. And uh, by the way, I've already have the slide deck posted out on the uh, users group website, so you can download that. I'll post the replay of this as soon as I get it uh, downloaded and converted and uploaded back out there. So, David, thank you very much for doing this for us. And you got several people saying great job and thanking you on the chat window, in case you can't see. Well, it. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. And, uh, Glad I was able to help out. All right, everybody. I guess we will conclude the meeting for the day. Thank you for attending.